Okay, in the last lesson, we kind of talked about the economy of the South. Well, in this lesson, we're going to talk about what life in the South was like. All right, when you think of the South, you think of these large, beautiful plantations, you know, with uh, beautiful homes and lots of slaves everywhere. Well, in fact, that's actually pretty rare, okay? These people that did own these uh, big plantations is the cottonocracy. The cottonocracy, okay? This is less than 1% of the population, all right? 1% of the population own more than 50 slaves. But they go on to become, you know, local leaders, politicians. They control and dominate, dominate the South, all right? They're the ones that are making the laws. They are in local government, state government, okay? And they dominate everything. Now, they have beautiful homes. You know, they, they bring in the finest teachers for their children. Their children are sent to the finest colleges and schools in Europe and military academies for their young men. They buy very expensive things, often from Europe. And um, they actually kind of act like, you know, nobility. You know, they fancy themselves as noblemen. These guys, you know, the, the men in this household, they don't do anything on the farm. They're not out there supervising. They have overseers. They hire plantation managers that make sure that everything is, is going okay. They, they're the ones that are looking over the slaves. They're the ones, you know, these, you know uh, these overseers are making sure the work gets done. They're making sure that the, you know, the owner of the plantation is getting his money. The women... You know, they're often involved in social events, uh, balls, charities, things like that. And they live in these beautiful homes, these big mansions. And they're kind of the center of, uh, of the happenings. Lots of formal functions for other uh, important families. And uh, again, though, please know this. This is rare. 1% of the population. But what you need to know is this 1% of the population completely dominates um, the political course of the South. All right. The next group we need to talk about are small farmers. Now, this is the majority, 75% of Southern whites. These are just kind of plain folks. They own the land. They own the land that they have. And if they're lucky, if you want to call it lucky, they might have one, maybe two slaves. Remember, slaves are expensive, folks. You know, in today's money, I've heard Anywhere between eighty and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in today's money would it cost to buy a slave? So these people don't have a lot of slaves, and if they are fortunate enough to be able to have a slave, they're in the field right next to them, working right along with them. The difference is they're getting all the profit, they're getting all the reward for the work. That slave is not getting anything other than hard work and and, and toil. All right. The third group for whites, we can talk about poor whites. These people had hard lives. They do not own the land that they live on. They rent this land. They might raise corn and beans. They might raise some cattle, some hogs. But uh, they have to pay their landlord for this land, often in the form of, of crops or, or livestock. The one difference, though, between them... And African Americans, they could say, you know something, this stinks. I hate it. I quit. I'm going to Oregon. And they could. Could an African American do that? Well, absolutely not. The slave is forbidden to leave this land. So the thing you need to know is that few white people actually own slaves. Few. But all are impacted. All are impacted. I've had a lot of students ask me, like, well, Mr. Mercer, if only, you know, very few own slaves then um, why did so many people support it? Uh, a couple theories. The one that really I think is, you know, they probably support it because they think, hey, maybe someday, maybe if I work hard, maybe if I save my money, I will be able to buy a slave, which is going to allow me to produce more goods to make more money. That's my guess, is why other people, you know, kind of support this institution of slavery, even though very few people actually own slaves. Okay, so here's a, another chart I want you to look at. All right, this is the entire population of the South. Okay, blacks and whites. Free slaves, or free African American slaves and whites. All right, you will see that uh, only 8% of the population 
owned five or more slaves. Eight percent of the population. Okay, and remember, one percent is the cottonocracy. Okay, this very small little tip right there. That's the cottonocracy. Those are the people that own at least fifty or more slaves. All right. Another eight percent of the whites might own one to four slaves. They're pretty well off, you know, financially, economically. But 50% of all whites owned no slaves at all. These are the small farmer, farmer, and poor whites who don't own their land. Okay. Oops, that, didn't, that doesn't look good at all. Okay. Now, the rest of the population is African American. So 34% of the people in the South are African American. 34%. Okay? 2% of these are free African Americans, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And 32% are slaves. So almost one out of three people in the South is a slave. Okay, let's talk about these free African Americans. All right, there are free African Americans. In 1860, there's almost 200,000. Now, these are descendants mostly of slaves freed during the American Revolutionary War. Remember, Washington said that, you know, if you fight for the cause of liberty, we will grant you your freedom. And if you remember, I think there was, oh, geez, I'm probably off on this, but I'm going to say 6,000 or so. Well, their descendants are free. Most of these people, again, are going to live in Maryland, in Delaware, where slavery is really on the decline anyways in those northern parts of the South. Okay? However, slave owners don't like these people. They do not. Why? Because they don't want these free black people walking around. It might encourage their slaves to revolt. They've also told their slaves, hey, listen, you're lucky to be a slave because, you know, you couldn't survive without me. You know, what skills do you have? What, uh, what are you going to do? So, if slaves saw free African Americans thriving and succeeding, succeeding, they're going to go, "Hey, this what this guy's telling me is not correct, not true." All right? So the slave owners don't like them in their neighborhood. Bad example would encourage their slaves to rebel. So what they do is they said, "Free African Americans could not vote or travel. They don't want them traveling around the South." you know, stirring up problems for the white slave holders, all right? So 200,000, mostly Maryland, mostly Delaware. However, there were some in some of the larger cities, Charleston, uh, maybe Atlanta, New Orleans. Um, but most of them, again, are going to be up in Maryland and Delaware. As I mentioned earlier, about one-third of the southern population is slaves. Most are field hands on cotton plantations, We've talked about that in the last section. You need lots of slaves to plant, to harvest, to weed, to take care of it. They work very long hours from dusk till dawn. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got that backwards. Dawn till dusk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I mean, uh, children, is, as soon as they can probably um, carry some water, they're out delivering water to the field. When they get a little bit older, they're going to be weeding, they're going to be planting, they're going to be picking and this is going to be, uh, you know, a really, really tough life. Um, if you're lucky, you might become what's called a house slave, where you would be actually tending inside the house. You might be dressed a little bit nicer. You might have a little access to a little bit better food. But you're still going to work uh, very, very, very hard uh, uh, life, hard conditions. All right? Um, some of the enslaved actually do become skilled workers, like carpenters or blacksmiths. They might even be allowed to live in town. They might uh, be able to, you know, live a little bit more free than, than the people working on the plantation. But the thing you need to remember, though, none of their profit is going to go to them. It's going to go back to their slave holder, their owner. But still, I'm sure that that would be a better life. You know, you'd be able to work on your skill, your trade, your craft. Uh, you might live a little bit better conditions. But again, all that profit from all your work is going back to your slave owner. Now, the slave life, you know, is tough. And uh, the African-American community of those slaves, you know, they really kind of cling together. You know, that, that family bond. You know, it's tradition in Africa that, 
not only just the mother and the father and the children, but aunts and uncles and cousins, they, be, they form really tight bonds. And what's really tragic about this is because a slave owner does not recognize slave marriages at all. You know, their property just, you know, you might, you might consider yourself married and you might, uh, you know, uh, see yourself as a married couple, but legally it's not recognized. So therefore, a slave owner can at any time sell the wife away from the husband or the husband away from the wife or the children are away from their mom and dad. And oftentimes this does happen. Now, one thing that brings them comfort, though, is going to be religion. Religion. You know, they've, uh, in fact, the slave owners actually encourage religion. They think it might keep them a little more docile, might keep them a little more happy. Um, they hear stories about the Hebrews in bondage in Egypt and they're, they're singing songs about someday being delivered, looking for Moses, you know, freeing them, taking them to the promised land. So religion does kind of give them that sense that, you know, maybe this life might not be worth living, but maybe someday I'll have uh, the rewards of heaven or that we might be delivered from bondage. So religion becomes a key factor in the day-to-day -day life of an enslaved person. All right, to make sure that the uh, slaves are held in check, they pass what's called slave codes. You know, they're very strict laws governing slaves. Now, it's meant to protect them. In fact, it became a law that you couldn't uh, torture a slave or kill a slave. That's what they tried to tell people. But in actual, actuality, it's just a horrible form of abuse. All right? So here's some of the rules. When they're not working in the fields, you know, if they're off, they cannot gather in groups of more than three. Why? Because they don't want to plotting anything. So no more than groups of three. They could not leave the owner's land without permission. All right? You can't. Many of these slaves have never left the property. They don't know what's over the next hill. They've never been allowed to go to town. They don't know. This is to keep them ignorant. Not let them know what's on the other, uh, on the outskirts of their plantation. All right? If you're lucky enough, if you're a trusted slave, you might be able to get a pass to go to town to get run an errand for your for your owner. But everywhere you go, you're going to be questioned. And you better have something that says that you're allowed to be off your land. Obviously, they could not own guns. And the real one is, is they, it was against the law. It was against the law to teach a slave to read or write. Why? Well, they want to keep them ignorant. And remember this, guys. I've talked about this a lot. These slaves are ignorant. That does not mean... They're not smart. It means they're not educated. There's a big difference. <clears throat> These people are as smart as anybody else, but they've never been given the opportunity. They have not received an education. They are uneducated. And they do that for a reason. So they can't read a train schedule. So they can't read a map. So they can't escape. Okay? Now, remember I told you that uh, slave codes are really meant to protect them. Right? And again, it was technically illegal to torture a slave or to kill a slave. But here's the deal. A slave could not testify in court. Could not testify in court. All right? So a slave owner beats a slave or he murders a slave, and the other slaves go and test. I mean, they're gonna, we're going to take you to court. Well, guess what? They can't testify against a white person. So really, that slave owner can do almost anything he wants to his slaves without any kind of, of recourse. Nothing's going to happen to them because the slaves cannot testify. All right? So the slave codes are horrible. Cannot, and the big one again, and that's why I wrote that in red, is they cannot learn to read or write. It is against the law. Now, here's what I suspect, though. You know, if you, if you live on a plantation and you're three or four years old, uh, before you're really working out of the fields, you might have an opportunity to play with maybe the white landowner's children. And they might have toys, and they might have books. And uh, just being children themselves, they might teach you how to read it. What is that? Well, that's the letter A, or that's a, you know, whatever. Um, you're also going to see instances where slave owners, and oftentimes the women, would have a, take a certain liking to a slave, and maybe bend these rules a little bit. Maybe teach them to read a little bit. Teach them what this Bible verse meant in the Bible. So, even though it's against the law, there are some instances where the slaves do learn 
to read and write. Okay, kind of got ahead of myself earlier, but let's talk about this again. You know, slaves work up to 16 hours a day, very long. It doesn't matter how hot it is or how cold it is or how stormy it is, they're going to be out there working. Hard for the families to stay together, remember, because the like I told you, Southern law does not recognize slave marriages or families. Therefore, the slave owner can sell anybody he wants to somebody else. Um, again, like I mentioned before, there are allowed to be Christians. Religion does help them cope. All right, let's just get to the last part. Many of them, though, do try to escape to the north. Very few made it. Now think about this. Where are you going to go? If you're lucky enough to get off your plantation, you know, um, everywhere you go, people are going to be asking you, what are you doing here? Where's your papers? You know, it's going to be tough. Um, very few are going to make it. Remember also, it used to be a place they could run off to. That was the Negro Fort in Florida. But remember, Andrew Jackson, his invaded Florida, destroyed the Negro Fort. And now Florida belongs to the United States. So that took away a refuge for some of these runaway slaves. So it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, there were some revolts. Nat Turner, 1831, is a perfect example of this. He rose up against his owner, murdered them. He goes on a rampage through Virginia. I think he kills like 57 people. Just scares the dickens out of the white people. I mean, they are looking all over for Nat Turner and his group. They end up murdering uh, a bunch of innocent African Americans looking to find him, try, probably trying to find out information. They finally do catch Nat Turner and they execute him. But again, there's always that fear. If you think about it, you're on a plantation, you might have 100 slaves, there might be one white family there. Um, and there's always a kind of that fear, underlying fear that the slaves are going to rise up in revolt against um, you know, their white owners. Um, however, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention before I come to the end of this little lecture is that the slaves are expensive. As I've told you before, very expensive. And some slave owners may have treated their slaves fairly well. Some of them may, might have made sure they had clean cabins and clean clothes and plenty to eat. But there's going to be other slave owners who are going to provide the bare minimum. The bare minimum. But again, it's really advantageous for a slave owner to keep his slaves healthy. Right? Because why? They want them to work. They want them to produce. You know, uh, it does you no good to have a slave with... Um, a broken back or broken legs, all right? You know, you're not going to go out there and, and beat your horse because you're upset with it, even though those do occur, especially on large plantations and especially by those overseers. Um, it's still advantageous to make sure that your slaves are at least healthy enough to produce, all right? But one last thing, though. It doesn't matter. You could be the kindest you could be the most kindly slave owner in all the South. You might have a legitimate fondness or maybe even a sort of affection for your slaves, but does not make it right. You know, I love my dog. My dog has a great life. My dog has a cushy bed and lots of toys, but it's my property. Is it ever right for another human being to own another human being, to deny them liberty, to deny them their freedom? Well, obviously the answer is no. So regardless of how kindly or how um, benevolent you may be to your slaves, it is still wrong. All right? So there you have it. We've talked about both the North and the South, their economy and their lives. And that's the end of this unit. All right. See you soon.